Hello and welcome to I'll Knit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Maury of Drea Renee Knits and this is where I try my very best to answer some of your questions. Um, I have a fun little update today to share. So I've in some previous episodes talked a little bit about my autoimmune disorders and it sparked some great conversations of other people dealing with similar things. I have Hashimoto's and celiac disease and this past year I have been trying really hard to help put my, at least my Hashimoto's, you can't really put celiac into remission, but um, trying to get my Hashimoto's into remission through diet and other lifestyle changes. And one of my big symptoms that I had was after I had my babies, I had postpartum alopecia where I lost a bunch of hair and it never came back. Um, I think actually having my kids is what flipped the switch and turned on my autoimmune disorders. But I went to the hairdresser today and I'm almost a year of no gluten and I am um, like eight months of, well, more like six months probably. I don't know. Anyways, doesn't matter, but I'm pretty far into my other dietary changes. And today I got my hair done and my hairdresser saw a whole bunch of new growth. Um, so anyways, that's pretty exciting for anyone else out there trying to figure out their health. One of the hardest things is that there's so much conflicting information out there that it, there's always this, I don't know if I'm doing the right thing feeling and I tend to doubt myself and it can be a struggle sometimes. So I feel like having those little things happen, that's like, oh man, like this is something my body was struggling with before. And then seeing that shift is pretty exciting. So I wanted to share that. I hope anyone else out there dealing with autoimmune disorders, um, just you're not alone. And I hope that you find some answers as well. All right, let's answer some questions. So question number one, how would you go about adding sleeves to Velocor? I really like the look, but would like to have long sleeves. Man, that's something I forgot to grab. I'm gonna peek over here real quick and see if I have Velocor. Um, I brought all this other stuff up for this episode and forgot about Velocor. So, yeah, I don't have it up here. Okay, do I have back shoulder? I do. So this will work. So Velocor, um, I'll put a link of course below in the show notes, but Velocor is a slip stitch stripey. Um, I made it as a summer top. So it has, I used a wool cotton blend and short sleeved kind of crop sweater, um, but it's drop shoulder just like the week under. So here's my week under. And so this would actually be really easy to add long sleeves to. So in the directions, it has you pick up stitches around the side of the body. And instead of just knitting a cuff, you would just go right back into the stitch pattern and knit it to your desired length. You may want to do some decreases depending on what size you want your cuff. For me, I tend to like about an eight inch cuff. Um, but that'll just depend on you. You could always look at one of your other sweater patterns that you really like the fit of and look at the measurement on the schematic for the cuff circumference. And you could go ahead and decrease down to that point. Um, and I would just decrease along the bottom of the sleeve. It depends on how many stitches you need to decrease. So you're gonna find that out by just doing a little bit of math. So you already know how many stitches to pick up because that's written in the pattern for you to do the little cuff for the short sleeves. Um, so you would still pick up that amount of stitches and then you would look at the gauge and multiply your stitches per inch by the circumference you want. So let's say my gauge was four stitches per inch and I wanted an eight inch cuff, I would just multiply four times eight and that would tell me I need to decrease down to 32 stitches from wherever I started and depending how long you wanna make that sleeve. So a drop shoulder, it really depends on how far, how much ease was in that sweater so you know how far down your arm it's already going. Um, I usually like between 14 and 16 inches on a drop shoulder for the amount of ease I generally wear them with. Um, so minus your cuff at the end, which on that sweater is pretty short. So you would just kind of decide within that length 
how to space out your decreases, however many decreases you may need. And that's, that's really it. So I hope that makes sense. All right. Um, and that one is knit like the sleeves down from the body. So you can kind of try it on as you go. All right. I am an advanced beginner knitter. I am interested in learning brioche and have signed up for a workshop. Do you think it would be easier for a new learner to use wool of one color or two colors? So I hope I'm reading this right. Um, I'm thinking you're talking about using either just one color wool or using two different colors of wool. So using doing two color brioche versus one color brioche. Um, if you're talking about a ball of yarn that is multicolored, I don't recommend using that when you're first learning brioche because it's hard to see what's going on. So if you're talking about using like a variegated yarn, don't use that. I would stick with solid colors. I think they're a lot easier to see what you're doing. Um, but I personally, I always teach new briochers two color brioche. And the reason I do that is for one, it kind of ups your skill level right away when you're learning brioche, you'll be able to jump right into two color brioche, which I think is a why a lot of people are drawn to brioche is that multicolor aspect of it. Um, but also it's a lot easier to see what's happening. So when you're using contrasting colors, as you're learning brioche, you're gonna really learn the anatomy of those stitches when you're using two colors and you can see what's going on. So that's what I would recommend. Um, there's another link here. All right, so next up we have a spinning question and these were actually two questions that were kind of similar. So I threw them in there together. So curious what CVM wool is and where did you get it? What makes it your favorite? I have spun lots of different types of wool and really curious to try CVM. I usually, I gravitate towards a BFL. It is on my wish list to spin enough of a natural color for a sweater. Your oatmeal three ply is just beautiful, thank you. Um, okay, so CVM is California Variegated Mutant. And basically, um, I highly recommend this book, Fleece and Fiber by Deborah Robson and Carol. I don't know how to say Carol's last name. I apologize. Icarus, Icarus. Um, so this goes over all the different fibers you'd want to spin. It's a really great book. And so I looked at CVM because I was curious. I was like, I actually don't know a ton about it. Um, but basically it's got a really soft hand. Most people find it totally comfortable to wear next to their skin. It has a long staple length. So I found it really easy to spin. Um, and it's, it's delightfully soft and springy. So why I love it is because I love a lofty yarn. Like I'm always very drawn to kind of wooly, airy, wool and spun, bouncy yarns. I find them to be really warm because they trap in air and keep us warm. I also like how lightweight I find that sweaters that are knit out of a wool and spun lofty yarn tend to mimic a ready to wear sweater a little bit more. So that's just my preference. And this yarn, even though I didn't spin it wool and spun, it was roughed up. It's not like perfectly straightly combed. So it was, it's, I probably sound like such a novice, which I am, but it was roughed up enough that as I spun it, it gave it this wool and spun feel, even though I was still doing a worsted spun. So I highly recommend trying it. I think if you like a BFL, I think that you will really like this. It's to me a little woollier than a BFL, um, but just delightful and really soft. I definitely don't feel like it would be scratchy at all. Um, so I also dug out my where I got mine from and I'm gonna pop those links below. So the oatmeal colored one that I've already spun up, that is from Winter Wind. Let me look. Yeah, I was right, Winter Wind Farm. And so I linked their Etsy shop down below and then I'm getting ready to spin up this kind of dark charcoaly brownish gray. Um, and this is from Never Say Never Farm, which is from Michigan. So it has a special place in my heart. And I linked theirs as well. Um, so 
part two of this question, well, let me find it. Um, I have a rather large stash of random four ounce dyed braids, me too, uh, from different dyers that I'm now realizing isn't enough for larger projects. Moving forward, I've decided to make sure I'm purchasing enough wool to knit larger projects, such as sweaters and shawls. You've talked about buying enough yarn for projects, but do you have a specific weight you buy in wool for your hand spun knits? Also, you've referenced your oatmeal CVM hand spun. How many ounces did you buy and what was your total yardage? Any other tips or tricks you have in the realm of buying wool to spin for knitting? So I really am still quite new at this and I tend to be, a, um, I'd rather have extra than not enough person. I'm definitely somebody who's gonna buy an extra skein of yarn for a project. I don't wanna be caught short, especially because you can always use it. You can knit a pair of socks, you can knit a hat. So I do feel that way about fiber as well. I, I can't give a ton of tips. I've seen some articles written about it, but they're quite complicated. It's lots of measuring and weighing and stuff. So I feel like for me, um, you can't really necessarily do that when you're at like a fiber fest and maybe buying fiber in person. Maybe somebody else, I'm sure we have some amazing spinners who might tune in who could give us some tips on this, but there is the whole two pound rule, like buy two pounds and you'll have enough. Um, I did look and I had bought 28 ounces of that first CVM that I spun up and that, so the way I know that's enough for a sweater is really by looking at it. So do you ever feel like, I'm just running to grab it. I think it's one of those things like when you cook or bake or any of that stuff, the more you do it, the easier it becomes to visualize and just kind of know. So, I mean, this is, that's, that's all of it. I mean, that's a lot of yarn. So visually, I think that's enough for a sweater. I'm sure it would depend on stitch patterns and how big I wanted to make it, but I, I definitely think this is plenty. This is like, look at this big boy. It's huge. Um, I don't know the yardage on this, which is so funny. I can't believe I didn't count it up. I was looking through my little journal, which I'll show y'all in a second. And I don't have any notes on yardage. So I have no idea how many yards this is. Since spinning this, I was just trying to think if I'd gotten this before or after, because I thought I was still spinning this at Christmas time. I'm gonna have to look, but since spinning that, for Christmas, my present this year was an Acre Works Skeiner. So if you haven't seen one of these, it's pretty amazing. Um, these pop up. Oops. I have to remember how to put it together. Oh, it goes like this. And these go on here. Basically, you kind of get the gist of it but this all comes together, shwink. And you can rotate this. So your yarn comes off of your bobbin after you've plied it. And the best part about this is right here. Ooh, that is a yardage counter. So now that I have this, I actually have much better records of my yardage. So I don't get into situations like right now where I'm like, I don't remember. I don't remember my yardage. Um, I feel, I thought I was still spinning that around Christmas time, which I think then that I would have skeined it up on here. Um, but maybe not. Maybe I'd already finished it. So anyways, I don't know my yardage. I should figure it out because once I knit that up, I'll probably want to write up the pattern and then everyone's going to need to know the yardage. So I'll work on that. I'll update everybody. Um, but yeah, so there's the two pound roll. But then also I was going to say with all those braids you have. So when it comes to buying dyed top, so those really pretty braids, I'll grab one that you have to spin. I will say what it reminds me of. So this is one from Hello Yarn. 
and I've got one from Nest Fiber too. So when it comes to these, sometimes I don't know how colorful I'm gonna want that. Like, will I want a sweater's quantity of this? And so I think it's okay to buy just one or two four ounce braids like this and then use them as your accent colors, either in a color work or a mosaic sweater or in shawls. I mean, that's really why I designed Find Your Fade it was to use up because a lot of us have done that just with yarn. We will go to a yarn festival and we buy that one really special skein. And then we're like, what do I do with this? <laughs> so that's why I designed that shawl. It was to use up all those odds and ends. So other great patterns to use up, um, some of your smaller braids would be like, the shift cowl would be perfect. If you picked out three of your four ounce braids, and spun those up that you like together and knit the shift cowl. It would be awesome. So I don't think it's bad to buy some of these fun colorful ones in smaller quantities. And then I usually buy my undyed more natural um, fiber is what I personally use for my sweater quantity. Um, especially because I feel like more decision goes into spinning the color ones. I'm not sure how it's gonna turn out where when I'm you know, spinning something like this, I can, it's easier for me to gauge what I'm gonna wanna do with that. I love it. Sorry, I just knocked my, my little headphone here. Okay, so did I answer that all? Um, but yeah, definitely do look at, I, I mean, a Google search. I did a quick one before starting this episode today and I, somebody needs to do an app like like the Stashbot app for spinners. So I'm requesting that somebody do it. <laughs> I would love it. All right, let's keep going. So next question, how do you decide what to design? Do you plan to design a certain number of sweater, shawls, hat, socks in a single year or just design what comes to your imagination? So generally my goal since I first began designing, which will be eight years. Can that be right? I think it'll be eight years this October or November. Wow. Ooh, time flies when you're having fun. All right. So, um, my goal ever since I started was to always, um, was to try and release one design per month. So that actually just has happened to work out really well for me. It seems to be a good timeline that I can keep up, keep up with. There are definitely months where I release more than that, depending if I've done collaborations. There's just certain times of year where things are kind of busier. Um, so sometimes it's more than that. But And as far as how I decide what to design, it's usually led by either there's a yarn I'm just like super stoked about that I just got and I want to get out of my needles or I like come up with some kind of like whether it's a stitch pattern or I want to play with stripes. Um, so yeah, there's usually just one little like spark that sets it off and I kind of decide from there what will be the best way to show off either the yarn or the stitch pattern. What am I in the mood for sometimes? You know, I definitely think that most things in our life is very cyclical with the seasons. And so there are times when I just, all I want is sweaters. And then I'm like, oh, I just want it socks. You know, I just think we go through different phases. Um, I have started getting really into my little knit along challenges that occur in May and November. And May is hats and November socks. So those are pretty steady. I always try to have a new pattern for those. So that'll kind of determine that. And then the one sweater I plan on every year is the Rhinebeck sweater. And besides that, it's kind of a free for all. It just depends if I'm doing it on my own or doing collaborations um, will be the only thing that'll kind of adjust that. But usually I all of a sudden want something. You know, I, I very much design for myself, whether it be for like a gap in my wardrobe or it's just something I really wanna try. A lot of times I'm curious about a certain kind of shaping. Um, there's definitely certain designs that I find more relaxing. And so sometimes that's what I'm craving. I'm craving doing what I know, what I know I can kind of like play around with, have fun, it's a little more lighthearted. And then sometimes I'm like craving that, like I wanna really push myself and learn something new. And so then I'll um, kind of get like, do a more heady project. Um, so yeah, 
I do my, my minimum is usually 12 a year, but I've always done more than that. It's just kind of the way it happens. And otherwise it's just what I'm in the mood for. Um, all right, next question. This is also a design question. I am just starting along the path to try independent knitwear design. Congratulations. And I would love to know more about how you learned about and navigated marketing and running a small business. Did you have any marketing and business experience? Did you have any mentors or encounter helpful resources to learn about these things? Or did it all come naturally to you? I would love to hear anything you have to share about these topics as a knitwear designer. So I'm going to kind of break this one down so I don't forget any of it. Um, so let's just kind of go right back to the beginning. Um, so... I did not have any marketing or business experience. I've been working since I was 13. So I started working young. I think I have a really strong work ethic, which I think if you're gonna have your own business, you gotta have a strong work ethic because you're, you never clock out when you have a small business. You're always working. Um, so you also wanna make sure it's something you love. But I just think that that work ethic kind of led a lot of it. Um, so yeah, I didn't go to school for business. I didn't go to school for knitting or design or fashion or anything like that. I went to culinary school and it was like a little hippie culinary school. Um, and then I went to cosmetology school. So I definitely didn't like have any formal training as far as this goes. But I do think that I've always kind of had an entrepreneurial spirit and I became like the manager at every job I've ever had. So I think it's just, maybe there is a little bit of that that's just ingrained in me. Um, but I wanna jump to, but in general for marketing, um, things are changing and they're changing so quickly. I know that there's been loads of changes with like the Instagram algorithm. So I will say I felt like, Instagram was very helpful when I was getting started. Um, you know, it's a free source of marketing. I think that they just announced that they're switching to prioritizing videos and reels instead of still images. And I only do still images. So I think that the need to really understand social media is kind of getting more important where I never, I don't know that much about social media. I just I just post like I've never done it on a schedule. I've never like had this plan. I just kind of I'm like, I here's my knitting. It looks pretty today. I'm gonna post a picture. Um, but I do think it would probably be helpful now getting started if um, maybe you're you're young and you're in the know and you just get all that social media stuff. But I think kind of being into to that stuff, it's a great resource to use. Um, I Ravelry was really helpful for me when I was getting started because they really spelled out exactly how to get everything onto the site. You basically go through like this giant checklist. So if you haven't done that yet, you create a pro account. And when you go to put up your first pattern, I mean, it goes through step by step. And so I think that that was really helpful because that kind of paved the path for me figuring out how to do it on my own website, which I started probably like one or two years after I had gotten going. Um, I use Squarespace for my website. This is not an ad, <laughs> I just use them. And I will say, so I'm not tech savvy. I am recording this selfie style on my cell phone. I just, it's not where I put my energy is into tech stuff. And I could do Squarespace. So I do think like for a website, that's a pretty easy, um, one to use and you can set up a shop. Um, besides that, like setting up a PayPal account's pretty easy. Again, they kind of walk you through that. So that stuff's all pretty helpful. I did find back where we used to live, the local community college actually had free business advisors. And so I did schedule a meeting to go check um, chat with a business advisor, especially as we started to make decis decisions as a family. Um, but that can be really helpful. And that's actually how I found my tax person because some of that behind the scenes stuff that's not as fun uh, can be really tricky. And so I think finding like a good person like that um, to figure out all that stuff is super helpful. And I did not have any mentors. Um, I will say Stephen West, he was super awesome at answering some of my questions. Um, he taught up in Northern Michigan and 
he was so great. We spent time together and he was very open, like ask me anything. Um, so that was just really nice. I think that there's a lot of us who, it, it's not a, like, it, it's not a secret. Like I'm happy to share anything I can. I'm not always the most eloquent, but I'll definitely share anything that's like worked for me. Um, and yeah, I think, I think definitely asking people, I think going to certain things, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of like all over the place now because this is a big question and I'm trying not to forget any of the things I want to say, but I think going to events and showing up to things is really great. Um, when, as soon as I could and was able to, so the, the money I first began making with my patterns, like that's how I went to my first Vogue um knit live in new york and so i think as things start reopening if you can go to events it's just such a great way to meet people you can find yarn support it's just a great way to network is to show up at events so i think that was super helpful i think using instagram and ravelry was super helpful for me in the beginning um i think one of the most important things that i have recognized within my own business is that since the beginning i have always chosen to knit what really fills me up and makes me happy. Like what, as I'm knitting it, I'm excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for this to be done. I hope this works. I can't wait to try it on. Like all those feelings. I think if you are feeling that while you're working on your design, that absolutely translates to the finished product and to your pattern. And I think people are drawn to that. So I think really leading with your heart, not necessarily chasing trends and fashion. I've never been good at that. I, it's taken me my whole life to figure out what my style even is and how I like to dress. It's been a long, slow, bumpy road for me. Um, but I think staying really true to yourself and like if it fills you up with that bubbly, like excited feeling, then you're on the right path. And I think people feel that. So I think that's been a cornerstone of my business. Um, encounter helpful resources. So I've kind of already talked about a couple. I'm just trying to think if there was any other. I do think that doing some publications in the beginning, one of the things that's really nice about that. So because I used to be a baker, pattern writing came kind of naturally to me because I was used to doing that similar layout of you've got your abbreviations and you, you're writing a recipe. But I do think that if you can um, submit, there it is, a design proposal, to some different like knitting magazines and things like that, that then what happens is if your idea is chosen, they'll send you how they want you to write that pattern. So that's a great way to kind of start figuring your layout. And then also getting a good tech editor. My tech editor has been amazing. She helped me get consistency. I wouldn't even realize that I would like switch. Like sometimes I would have this be in an uppercase and then sometimes I wouldn't. So having a great tech editor is super helpful um, just to have everything be cleaned up. And again, I know that Ravelry is not a resource for everyone now. Um, so as I come across any new places, if I see any of this, I'll definitely give a shout out to those things. But um, I have had people ask where I find test knitters and where I find tech editors. You can find both, there's forums on Ravelry for both of those things. So there's a test knitter forum where you can actually post what you want tested there and people check that who like to test knit patterns. Um, I post on my Instagram and in my Ravelry group and then there's also a tech editor pool there. Um, but again, and a non rebel resource would be um, showing up to the different events and things like that. Again, there's a lot of people who go that do all different parts from the industry. And so those can be a great place to meet people and just asking and reaching out. Um, you know, I, I really think that there's a lot of helpful people who would love to, to help. <laughs> Uh, okay, I kind of went off on a tangent on that one. I hope it was clear, but keep those design questions coming. I'm super happy to answer them to the best of my ability, uh, but it was fun to get a couple of those today. Uh, all right, bonus question. I was wondering if you're intending to be at Rhinebeck this year in October. I am. 
So I think I mentioned that in the last episode. I also mentioned about doing a sneak peek. So my Rhinebeck sweater comes out in just over a week and I'm super excited. Um, so yeah, sign up for my newsletter before next week. So you can make sure to find out when that's posted. And of course, I always give a little discount to my newsletter subscribers. So there's a link below in the show notes for that. Anything else? Anything I forgot? I guess that's it. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for hanging out with me. Send me your questions. There's a link below. Again, right below this video, you'll see that there is a description. Just click show more. And that's where you're going to find whenever I'm talking about links, that's where you find them. You can also subscribe if you want to be able to know when my new videos are available. I think there's also a little bell icon you can hit and then it actually sends you a notification. So, but otherwise these videos come out every Friday and a smattering of tutorial videos go out randomly. So again, if you're subscribed, you'll know about those right away. And I hope you have a great weekend. Yeah, all right, happy knitting. I'm back. I realized two things. I forgot to show you my new dress. This is another Orchards dress, like the one I showed in the last episode. Um, but this one, I had so much fun with. I extended the bodice by two inches and then I patchworked it all the way to the bottom and played with the stripes with vertical and horizontal. Um, so anyways, that was super fun. The patterns by Vivian Xiao Chen. Um, I'll throw that link again below. And then I totally said I would show this and I forgot. So this is my knitting notes from Lina Magazine, but I use it as my spinning journal. So I think they should do a spinning journal. Um, but anyway, so I do things like this. So I talk about, you know, the name of the fiber, where I got it from, how much I got. This shows, I tried plying it two different ways. One was a two ply. Um, there was a question, somebody asked what a ply was. So that's just a single strand of the yarn. And so sometimes the yarn might only have one ply um, or sometimes it might have more. And it's also, the ply is how you decide to combine those two yarns, right? Anyways, um, so, and then the, like I try to keep a label and I'm gonna start putting in here I just need to go through and do it um I bought a Polaroid camera and have been taking photos so just like my clothing journal that my sewing journal I'm gonna be doing that with my hand spun as well I don't know what this yarn is this is not hand spun I don't know why this is in here um but I'm going to be taking Polaroids to put in here because I just think it's kind of nice to have that to reference, to be like, oh yeah, that's what that one looked like. Um, and then it's nice. So Hello Yarn, who I've done their fiber clubs, um, they actually send out little tags with their fiber, which is amazing because that's all that information that you can actually tie onto the skein because I know myself and I know I won't remember and I'll have a whole bunch of these hanging around being like, I wonder what this was and what, yeah, what I did to it. So, okay, that was it. Goodbye.